Good evening, everybody. I'm Jen Jordan. I'm one half of Eco Iowa City. I'm the recycling coordinator at the Iowa City Landfill, and, and Smart Waste Disposal, as you may know, is one quarter of the Eco Iowa City grant. Um, thank you for coming tonight. My other half of my the grant is Maeve Clark, just making her grand entrance here. She is the information coordinator at the Iowa City Public Library, which is why most of the Eco Iowa City events, such as tonight, are held here, which is a great part of the great partnership that we have. Um, before I talk a little bit about our speaker tonight, I want to mention a couple things coming up with Eco Iowa City. If you didn't get one of these in the back, these are kind of the key for our schedule for the rest of what we're calling Earth Month because we have so many great things planned, we couldn't get them all in a week or even a few, you know, a couple weeks. So we're, we renamed it Earth Month, which we've actually noticed a lot of people doing this year since it's the 40th anniversary. So. Um, the next event after tonight, as you'll see on here, is April 11th, which is Sunday. We actually partner with Project Green, which is one of our first partners in the grant, and we are very pleased to bring in a speaker to talk about great plants for the Great Plains. So that should be very interesting. It's Sunday here at the library from 2 to 4. Um, Tuesday night, um, Liz Christensen, who is the Office of Sustainability Coordinator at the University, um, and I will be talking about waste both in the, within the city and at the university and talking about where waste goes when it leaves your curb or your dumpster. Why is recycling important? All the fun stuff that I get really excited about. Um, there's a bunch more events on here, but I'm going to skip to the last two because they pertain to tonight's event. Um, on May 1st, which is the first farmer's market, we will actually have the comp excuse me, the rain barrel that we'll be selling through Eco Iowa City at a reduced cost the following week on May 8th. So again, we'll be at the first farmer's market from 7.30 to noon at Chauncey Swan Park here in Iowa City. And the rain barrel sale then will be the following Saturday, and all the information is on here. We will be selling rain barrels through um, a company called Upcycle Products, and they're basically recycled pickle barrels. Um, we're going to be selling them for $40, and they're on a first-come, first-served basis to Johnson County residents. So if you're interested, if you're, because you're, prob you're here tonight probably because you're planning on making your own, but if you know friends who are maybe not quite as handy or if you don't get a chance to make your own, we're, we'll be selling them for $40 um, on Saturday the 8th of May. So, all right. The other thing I wanted to mention before I introduce Chant, um, one of the things that we're obviously working on is stormwater. And if you've seen these, any Iowa City residents in here already purchased these for the year? Any Iowa City residents in here know what these are who haven't purchased them? <laughs> Please feel free to take these from either May, one for Iowa City residents only because they are only good in Iowa City. Um, these are yard waste stickers. These basically, what the city does is we encourage people to purchase these to put on containers of their own to put things like grass clippings and, and leaves and things like that in so that it's not getting washed down the sewer, the drain system. So please take one of these. These are an annual sticker, so this is good through March 31st of next year. And we sell these every year. They're a different color every year, so the city knows if you've actually bought one this year or not. Okay, moving on to Chant. Um, Chant Ike is a native of Iowa. He received his BA in Environmental Studies at the University of Oregon. He is a trained wetland delineator with ecological experience working with forest, riparian, and prairie habitats. Past employment includes work with private, nonprofit, and governmental organizations, and Chant believes that all of these groups have critical roles to play in future conservation efforts. Chant has a diverse background working with environmental and conservation issues. Past projects include environmental consultation, waste management, invasive species management, prescribed fire, environmental interpretation and education, GIS-based research, and habitat assessment. And tonight he's going to talk to us about how to make a rain barrel. Welcome, Chant. Thank you. Yeah, well, I'm glad to see we've got some folks that are interested. Um, <clears throat> I was pretty excited when I uh, was invited to talk about rain barrels. It's, you know, rain barrels, they're, they're not too complicated, but, uh, you know, if you, if you don't know what you're doing or if you kind of mess around with it or you get a bad experience with one, you might have a bad taste in your mouth. And I just want to, I'm excited to be able to tell you that, well, you can pretty much make it any way you want, pretty much do it any way you want. It's just a simple, practical thing that you can apply. So I'm pretty excited to be here and talk about it. Um, Maeve, can we turn these lights down? Excellent. Okay. Making a rain barrel and capture water for your garden, for your plants, for whatever else you want to use water for. And there we go. So tonight I'm going to talk to you about best management practices, which is a good term to be familiar with these days. Uh, what is a rain barrel and why? Cover some basics. Talk about some basic functions of a rain barrel. Get us all comfortable with the, with the ideas and what's involved. Give you some options on styles, 
Uh, I'm going to talk about the dangers, the dangers of rain barrels. This is important. All right, there's also winter storage because we live in Iowa, and as you are all very well aware, we have winters and they can be strong, and we want to protect our investments and our hard work. And then I'm going to get into the fun stuff and how to modify it. Basically, make it the way you want it to be. Now, my mantra is keep it practical because. You know, you can make things overcomplicated. You can make them, you know, you can get a really fancy, nice looking one, you order it online, and if it sits in your yard and it looks fancy and is nice, you never use it, then that's all it's doing, and it's really not accomplishing much. So keep it practical. When, when I'm talking about this stuff, keep in mind, well, you know, I have my, you know, my tulips are over here and my Yard is, you know, my, my dry spot in the grass is over here. Maybe that's an idea that would work good for me. You know, keep these things in mind and don't be afraid to uh, design it so that you'll use it because that's the key. If you don't use it, then it just looks pretty. And as you can tell, they don't really look that pretty. <laughs> so, again, design it so you'll use it. And please, ask questions at any time during the whole presentation. I'm here to keep it practical, and the only thing that I ask is that you allow Maeve to get to you with a microphone. So stick your hand up in the air at any time. I'm happy to answer any questions. All right, so BMP. Now, I, I wasn't that familiar with this. I've studied environmental studies for many years and been in the field, and BMP is kind of a new catchphrase, I think, for, for a, a lot of different things. Um, but basically, it stands for best management practices. And for the most part, this is in relation to stormwater. What we do with our stormwater. What's the best way to manage it? The way I like to think of this makes a, brings a little bit more to home is we're turning pollution into a resource. Because stormwater, in and of itself, it's, yeah, it's not a pollution. But once it hits the street, it is. It's, it's pollution the moment it hits the street because it's running down the street, it's picking up all the hydrocarbons, all the, all the oils, all the salt left over from the winter time, and it's carrying that into the storm sewer, which carries it straight into our rivers. It's pollution. So if we keep it from getting in the street, then we're turning that potential pollution into a resource. Now, there's a whole lot of different ways, you know, different, different ideas and practices that fall under best management practices. Rain gardens and bioswales, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with. Um, these are great. We can, we can take a lot of rainwater and do a lot of good stuff, you know, creating habitat, creating natural spaces for the plants and wildlife. Rain gardens and bioswales are excellent. And I've got one. We just put one in last year in our yard. They're, they're gorgeous. Previous paving is another best management practice that you know allows the water to infiltrate into the ground directly underneath the pavement instead of running into the street. So this is like you know utilizing it before it can cause damage. Native plant landscaping. Now this is one that I think is overlooked a little bit because you know you think well I'm planting my yard. I've got some you know honeysuckle over here and and I've got some butterfly bush over there and, and you know, and it's using rainwater and that's great. Well, native plants that are adapted to Iowa not only bring in the native wildlife that needs all the habit can, habitat it can get, but native plants also have deeper roots. Think of the prairies. They have deeper roots. They help infiltrate that water into the ground, bring it into the ground. They also help re retain sediment, not sediment, nutrients that are flowing through that water. So if you've got lots of nitrogens and phosphorus in the water, those native plants really help bring that out. They store it, like carbon sequestration, all sorts of good stuff going on with native plant landscaping. Green and living roofs, that's another good one. Uh, there's a neat uh, company in Davenport that has this cool modular sedum roof stuff that you can get where you can literally have them come up to your house and throw down slabs of green roof. You just put it right there. I mean, this, this stuff is excellent. And this is utilizing that rainwater. It's storing it in those plants instead of running it off into the street. 
Lawn improvement is another one that's overlooked a lot of times, I think. Um, you know, our lawns are really highly compacted. Um, and, you know, if, if your lawn looks anything like mine, the, the grass is not the biggest priority in my yard. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's compacted from, from, the, from the actual uh, development of the house and the development of the area. The soils probably aren't that good. So if you go through and just aerate the lawn, if you add some compost to the lawn to help, um, help uh, give the plants better root spaces, better infiltration for the rain, lawn improvement is a good one. I, and a lot of these I got off of the soil water conservation site. They have, they have great information on all of these, um, all of these practices. And, of course, there's rainwater capture or harvesting, which is what rain barrels are. Cisterns are another good um, method for doing this, although in Iowa they can be problematic. So, but we're here today to talk about rain barrels. Um, now, in the spring and the summer of 2009, we had about 30 inches of rain. Now, I've got a pretty small house. It's a little ranch-style house. Uh, I think the, the roof, well, I did the math here. 30 inches of rain fell during spring and summer last year. And a quarter of my roof runs into that rain barrel over there. And that's 6,417 gallons of water that ran through the rain barrel in spring and summer alone. So think about that. That's a lot of water that we could be using. Now, you might say, well, a rain barrel doesn't really divert that much water, but if you have a rain barrel on every house in this town, it diverts a lot of water. And if you're using it, it diverts even more. Again, keep it practical. Do what it takes to use it. Don't just set it up. Set it up so that you'll use it. All right. Now, everybody likes money, right? So, the city, as kind as they are, is providing us money to put rain barrels in our yards, and you gotta love that. Um, so you know, here's an application that the that the city has. It's called their best um, management practice application. And I've worked with government agencies, and I've seen a lot of government documents, and this isn't too bad. I mean, you've got your name, address. You select your your basic uh, BMP setup. Throw a little schedule information, your itemized cost. Now, let me tell you something. I put, we put a rain garden in our house last year. I estimated that it would cost about uh, $1,300. And this was without labor. And it was a pretty big rain garden. It was a rain garden between um, my neighbor's yard and our yard. And we diverted three quarters of the water from both of our roofs into the rain garden. The city paid for 95% of the materials, so you can't complain about that. I don't think you can expect them to pay that much all the time, but you know, I think that that's, that's a resource that we need to tap into as residents. All right, what is a rain barrel? Well, it starts with rain. We got plenty of that around here. It hits your roof, it's running down your roof, the rain runs down the gutter, runs down the downspout, and if you've got a barrel there, it runs into the barrel. Voila, you've got a rain barrel. Now, the water fills up pretty quick in the rain barrel. The key is to have an outlet, an overflow, so that when the water fills up, it doesn't just shoot out the top, but it flows out, and then you divert that flow to your yard again, divert it to your yard, divert it to your natural areas, um, don't divert it to the street, if, if at all possible. Um, and then, so we have our rain barrel. All we got to do is stick a spigot on the side, a little faucet, and it's storing our water for when we need it. Okay, why, why use a rain barrel? Well, our plants like it. Our gardens like it. It's not tap water. It's saving us money. It it's, doesn't have the chlorine in it that tap water has. 
It doesn't go through the processing that tap water has to go through to be potable. It's perfectly good water. We just can't drink it. Probably don't want to wash your dishes with it. But just about everything else, you can use a rainwater, or you can use rainwater for. There's plenty of options. Get creative. That's what I say. All right, so basic functions of a rainwater. For you and your house, for your household, provide free water. Can't complain about that. Chemical free water for your plants. They love it. Provide storage for when it gets dry out. Saves money because you're not, uh, you're not using the tap water up. Now what about the community? What does a rain barrel, what does your rain barrel provide the community? Water conservation. Sure, it's just a little 55 gallon drum, but 55 over 10,000 houses is a lot of water. Again, we're diverting the storm water. We're keeping the pollution out of our rivers. We're cleaning those rivers up. Every little bit counts. And hey, why not go so far as to say we're reducing flooding? Why not? I mean, if you've got, if you've got 10,000 rain barrels in a city, maybe it's not going to affect the Iowa River a whole lot, but you know that low spot in your, in your neighbor's uh, drive where the water tends to puddle up? If, if it's got to fill up five rain barrels before it can flow into that spot, then it'll, it'll slow it down. All right, what's it going to do for the planet? It's going to save the planet from pollution every little bit, last bit at a time. Sure, big goals, I think, I think it's important to have them. All right, so there's a few different rain barrel styles that I wanted to show you guys. Um, this one is great. This is, this is my neighbor's. It's straightforward, it's simple. So he lives in Iowa City. He, he got the automated curbside pickup bin a few years back, and he had his old trash can, and he thought, well, I could throw it away or I could do something with it. So why not stick it under my gutter and let, let it fill with rainwater? Put a hole in the lid so that the gutter flows in to it. Piece of cake. When he's ready to break it down for winter, he just pulls the gutter out, takes this flexible tubing, and, and which was connected up to here, and reconnects it up to the downspout. It's winterized. It's ready to go. How does he use it? He just takes the lid off, puts his, well, his watering can in there, and fills it up. He just dunks it in there and fills it up. I mean, I love it. It's, it's straightforward. It's simple. This, he uses it because it's, it's, just, it's what he needs needed. So here's another style. This one's a little fancier and uh, it looks really nice and you know, it's kind of wintery right now so you know it doesn't have the, the plants growing out of the planter but it does it has a planter on the top you know when this thing when you when when the spring is growing or is when spring is going and the growing season is in full activation you can't even tell she's got a rain barrel there which personally I like to be able to see it myself and know that it's a rain barrel but that's just me, a different aesthetic. But this one is really nice. It works good. It's got a screen on the back that uh, catches, catches your debris. You've got some uh, leaves coming in here. It catches it. You just scoop those out. It's got a little uh, outlet at the bottom. Um, just a good commercial example of what's available out there. Here's another commercial example. Uh, this one's kind of got the terracotta, uh, you know, adobe kind of look to it. Um, I, you know, again, it's got the little screen on top with the with the inlet, and then and then all your basic functions. It's got a hose outlet at the bottom, a spigot, and an overflow. Here's my rain barrel. It's not exactly pretty. Well, the cat likes it. You know, it's back here. It's in, the <clears throat> it's in the corner of my yard. It's up on cinder block. It's next to the hose and the old bird feeder, or the old bird bath. You know, it's, it's nestled away. And you know what? <clears throat> People comment on it, and they, they seem to like it. And the, the important thing for me is that it's practical. It's usable. I can walk right up to it. I'm a, I'm a fairly tall guy. It's bricked up four center block or three center block off the ground. 
This is my rapid fill spigot. You just open it up, you fill a two gallon uh, watering can in about five seconds, you walk away. Simple, it's easy. The outflow is channeled in to my, <clears throat> to my underground drainage system that goes down to the rain garden. You know, that could, be, that could go out your regular downspout. You know, it's, it's right where I need it. It's, it's accessible. I've built it so that I'll use it. Yes. Wait till Maeve gets to you with the, uh, with the microphone. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. If let me go, there we the go. Green hose. Where is that going? Ah, I will get to that. Yes, that is in the. That is that is one of those um, extra features. I'll t I'll give you a little sneak preview. I've got my uh, I've got my regular hose over here, my f and my regular faucet, as you can see. By hooking it up to a Y on the faucet, I'm, I'm linking it to my regular hose so that I don't have to disconnect my hose. So it's not, not a cross connection to the portable water? No, it's, well, it's the, the, the faucet is potable water, but it's going to the garden hose, which I never use for anything. Um, and it's not going to flow back into the, into the system in the house, so I don't have to worry about that. The idea with this is so that I basically have my, my hose linked to both the faucet and the rain barrel at the same time so that I just have to flip switches instead of maneuvering uh, hoses around. And yes, there's a valve there. And I'll show you that picture a little bit later too. <clears throat> All right, the dangers of the rain barrel. Prepare yourselves. Mosquitoes are out there. They can be a problem, or so I've heard. Mosquitoes, most of which like light to breed, so you want to you want to keep a dark barrel. Um, but the big thing is, is they need around here. They need about seven to day, seven days or so of stagnant water, and they really like the the stagnant stuff. So there's a few things you can do to not worry about mosquitoes. And one thing I do is have the rainwater always running through the rain barrel. So every time it rains, it always gets a fresh flush. And this keeps it, keeps the mosquitoes at bay. I've, I've never had any kind of um, um, stagnant water issues. And you know, because you can smell it. You open it up, you smell it. If it starts to smell bad, then you've got some possible mosquito issues. Now, a little bit later, I'll talk about diverters. And sometimes diverters can be set up so that when your rain barrel is full, it, the water keeps going down your gutter instead of filling into your rain barrel. And so then you might, you could potentially get stagnant water. But, you know, you can be creative too. Think about this. So you do start to, say for some reason you've, we've had a dry spell and and your water's starting to get a little smelly in there because you're not using it for some reason during a dry spell. And um, you can put a couple drops of vegetable oil in there, just like in a bird bath. That'll keep the mosquitoes from breeding. You could also go down to the local bait shop and get a handful of minnows and throw those in there. Those will keep the mosquitoes at bay just fine. Heck, why not throw a koi in there? There's no reason you can't. I mean, there's plenty of organic debris in there for, you know, little stuff for them to munch on. You know, is, if, you, if you threw a big enough fish in there that wouldn't get stuck in your hose, I think you'd be good to go. Seriously, I want to try it. I haven't had the need, though, so if any of you get the chance to do it, let me know. I'd love to see how it turns out. If the rain barrel is in the sunshine, do you think the minnows or koi could survive the heat? Uh, the question was, if the, if the rain barrels in the sunshine, could they survive the heat? Well, that's a good question. Um, they are tropical fish, so, you know, it, and, and that's a lot of water to heat up. So as long as the nights are fairly cool, I don't imagine that it would get too hot in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's, it'd be worth keeping an eye on. Um, 
it would have to, I think your color of your barrel would probably affect that too, you know. It'd have to be a, a, probably a black barrel to get that hot. Because mine gets some sun and I, it never really heats up. Uh, other dangers, I'm going to talk about uh, a little bit later, you know, you need to have it on a sturdy platform, especially if it's off the ground. You need to have it sturdy. You don't want that thing getting topsy-turvy topsy at some point. Um, you don't want any, any loose ground underneath it, any soft spots. You know, we are talking about a good 400 pounds worth of water in here. So we don't want, you know, the, the family pet or the neighbor's kid running up and getting a bunch of water falling on them. <clears throat> any other dangers? Anybody heard any horror stories? Any rain barrel scare tactics that we need to be aware of? All right, winter storage. Iowa winters will bust your rain barrel. You have to be careful. They've busted mine twice because I'm lazy. You got to be careful. Um, protect your hard work. Drain it completely. You know, if you have a little freeze thaw, freeze thaw, no problems. You're, you're not, you don't have to worry about it. Um, but once we, got, we get into late October, November, we start getting some of those hard freezes. If you've got water in there, 50 gallons of expanding water is going to crack your barrel. And if you've got, you know, fancy fittings and stuff on it like I do, it, <clears throat> it can get into there and, ex ex and uh, expand in, that, in those fittings. Also, if you have metal pieces in your barrel, the expansion and contraction is different than the plastic, so that can wreak havoc also. I know that uh, some commercial barrels, they swear up and, up and down, you can leave them outside all winter long, but it's not doing any, any good having a barrel full of ice anyway, so. <clears throat> Always make sure you reconnect your downspout. You don't want a sheet of ice coming down the side of your house. <clears throat> All right, now we get to do some of the fun stuff. Um, some of the tools that you are going to want to have available to you, um, depending on how elaborate you get. Uh, cordless drill is good. Uh, a jigsaw is good. Again, you can use hand tools if you, if you like to do it the old-fashioned way. That's, that's great. Um, <clears throat> hair dryer, believe it or not, is pretty handy. I'll get to that. Um, just some basic pieces. That uh, three-quarter inch uh, paddle bed on the right over there, that's a good item to have when you're, when you're putting your uh, faucet in. And, I'll, and you'll see me use these tools here in a bit. <clears throat> All right, so when it comes to modifications, Make it personal. You want this rain barrel to be your rain barrel. Okay. I'm not selling you my rain barrel. I'm selling you your rain barrel. So, you know, you can get these ones from the city for 40 bucks, and that's a heck of a deal. Because let me tell you, I mean, you've got the, I don't know if you all picked up this parts list. I guess I should have mentioned that earlier. But you can see it can get pricey fairly quick. Um, if you don't have one of these, don't be afraid to jump up and, and get one. Uh, Hannah's got some in the back, because when I'm walking through the items, this kind of shows you what I'm working with up here. The barrel from the city, that's just the barrel. The barrel, actually, yeah, so the question was the uh, barrel from the city. The barrel from the city will have a, all the basic functions that you need to have for an operational rain barrel. It's a good question. Um, and I've... And I've seen it, and I'll kind of point out some of the differences. Um, but yeah, you can't beat 40 bucks. And this barrel over here um, came from Orschlands, and they have a great, they have great rain barrels. Um, but it just is the barrel with the basic spigot at the bottom, just the regular hose spigot, and that's it. It doesn't have a hole in the top for the water to come in. Doesn't have an outflow. Doesn't have any of that stuff, which is what makes it a rain barrel. So that's a, I think that's I think they sell those for thirty bucks. So, you know that and the one from the city, those are great barrels to start with, and then modify as you need. Okay, so how will you use it? Keep this in mind. Keep it practical. All right, so we're going to start with a barrel. Just about any barrel will do. We're not picky here. Keep in mind, you don't want it to have harsh chemicals or thing, acids or pesticides in it because your plants probably won't like 
old wine barrels work great. And this is excellent. I personally, if I had old wine barrels laying around, I'd probably be keeping wine in them. But you know, if you've got extras, put it to use. Put it to work. You know, steel drums, they're not pretty, but boy, they'll last. They'll get the job done. Whatever's available to you. Here's a, this is pretty close to what the city is going to be selling. Something along these lines, uh, different colors. Again, you can see what I've got here down in front. It's pretty close to that. It's a standard food grade drum. Again, use an old garbage can. I mean, that's great. Great use. Kept it out of the landfill. And, you know... There can be hazards. <laughs> if you use a horse trough or other such barrels, you never know what might end up happening. So you keep, keep that in mind when you're choosing your barrel of choice. Okay, so elevate it. Here's some good elevation ideas. Remember that it's gravity that's feeding the water out of there. So, you know, when you've got a hose with 50 gallons of water pushing down on it, that's not coming out at very high pressure. So the higher you get it off the ground, the better pressure you'll have, the farther you can get with it. Now, if you're lucky like me, and the house is kind of upslope from the rest of the yard, then that makes it great for water and everything. But it's still just coming out at a trickle at the bottom. So the higher you get it off the ground, the, the better pressure you'll have. And, excuse me, the... Uh, the nozzles will be more accessible too because you, know, you don't want to have to walk up to the rain barrel and bend all the way over to turn it on every time. You get it up off the ground, save your back a little bit. Again, I'm tall, I keep these things in mind. Um, I put this one on here from Upcycle. This is, this is a really nice cedar, um, uh, cedar stand for it. Be careful with these. You've got four legs, and if one of those or two of those starts to get soft, and let me tell you, you get your spring leaks, you get a bad O-ring in here, or you, or you just, you know, it, it gets a little bit loose, and you get a steady trickle of water coming down the side, suddenly one leg, two legs start to get soft, the whole thing starts to tilt over. So if you use one of those, that's great. Just make sure it's on a steady base. I would, I would actually dig out a hole and put a couple of, cinder blocks down if it's going to be in a basic yard like situation. Now if it's on the edge of your driveway, perfect. All right, now to the good stuff. Let's talk about getting the water into the barrel. Okay, so you got to watch out for stuff like this. So we'll start from the top down and maybe if you wanted to turn the lights up that would be great. We'll start with the top, up on the roof. This is an excellent investment. If you're not lucky enough to have screens over all your gutters, um, just pop one of these over the hole in the gutter where it goes into your downspout, and this will save you endless hours of maintenance headaches. Sure, you still have to get up there. Sure, it clogs. You have to put your ladder up there and pull the leaves off of it once in a, once in a while. But this is a, a $3 headache saver. It's worth 10 bottles of Aleve. <laughs> All right. Now this is as simple as it gets right here. This is my setup, okay? You can see I had, you can see where my gutter straps used to be. I said, well, I want my rain barrel here. And the gutter's up there. And the shortest distance between two points and voila, there you go. Um, now, sure, it's, it's not the prettiest thing in the world. It looks kind of industrial. I kind of like that look. Um, there's no reason that you couldn't leave your gutter intact and maybe down about into here, put one of these things on there. This is a gutter adapter. And I really like this um, corrugated tubing because you can do a lot of different stuff with it. And they have, this is the four inch size, uh, they have a three inch also. It just pops right on there like this. This goes in your gutter. You put this on there, you can, you can, you can bend the uh, tubing to make it go where you want to. Um, 
you know, it, they have, uh, the hardware store has rigid elbows and things like that. Yes, question? Um, hold on a second. So you can't, sorry. If you're renting a property so you can't actually remove your gutter, is there a way to do it by just attaching it on the bottom gutter or will it not have enough pressure to get into the barrel? It's not going to have enough pressure. Um, that's when you go to your landlord with, with one of these things where I'm going to raise your property value by making your house more attractive. Um, in one of those so cases... you basically have to make a big change in the gutter. In order not to necessarily, not necessarily. A diverter is a good way to go um, in that instance and I'll talk a little bit about those later those are the those are the how should I say the they they're the least dramatic change because you essentially cut out a notch in the downspout again you're still cutting out a notch right. and you place this thing that then has an outlet that can go to your rain barrel I so see. so that's so a good the next tenant didn't want it you could close it up again yes exactly uh, another option if you were if it was a hilly property by chance, you could always put the rain barrel downhill and, and connect the gutter and run a pipe downhill to your rain barrel. Um, and that's an option if you've got a garden that's downhill or something and you don't want to run hose across your yard for the rain barrel, you could, you could actually bury a line or have, have hose going to a rain barrel that's next to your garden as opposed to having the water underneath the spout. Again, make it practical. Put it, put it where you want to use it. Um, so it has to be downhill to get the pressure. Yeah, it, it has to be, unless you want to invest in a pump and all this kind of stuff, which is, kind of goes against the, you know, the whole idea of keeping it simple. Um, the downspout does have enough place in the property. You just, just connect it up there and hook up something like that. Yeah, he's absolutely correct. You could just pull it off where he's got it connected to coming out of the downspout, leave the whole downspout on the house and just hook it up like he's got it. Thank you, yes. There's enough play. Yeah, and then just take that off and stick it back on. Yeah, he's absolutely right. And as a matter of fact, on my setup here, I have the entire downspout still intact in the same formation stowed away so that if I want to move the rain barrel or for whatever reason, I can just hook it right back up. So, yeah, as long as your landlord doesn't mind you doing some of that stuff, yeah, you can, you can, absolutely. And, you know, the, this stuff is pretty flexible. You can do a lot with it. Like I said, they've, they've, got, um, they've got rigid elbows and pieces so that you can make it a little bit more, um, uh, make it do exactly what you want. It's kind of big and bulky, yes, and, you know, one, if you wanted this to be a lower profile, then you could absolutely, again, put this right down here and then just, just have like a three-foot section just going right into your rain barrel from the, from the gutter. Um, that's, that would work just fine. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So, once we, once we have the water coming down, Another reason that I like these, these four inch corrugated tubes is because I use this as my screen. And the tube fits right in there. It's easy to fit in, it's easy to get out. Um, again, I have this screen on the roof so that I'm, so that I'm filtering out the, the bigger stuff. If some stuff still gets through, this filters it out. If stuff gets through this, it's going to be small enough that it will go out the overflow and completely out of the system, probably because it'll float, or it'll settle to the bottom, and then at the end of, this, uh, end of the season, I can clean it out. Um, so, how do we install this into this? Well, that was the part where we get to break out the power tools. Always wear safety goggles. Okay. Um, I need my drill. Uh, 
Another reason why I like this setup is that it's just, it doesn't take a whole lot of know-how. Take a cordless drill or a corded one. Take your, your atrium gate is what it's officially called. And again, they, these are, you can buy these just about anywhere hardware, any hardware store. I think it's about six dollars. I like to put it a little off center so that it uh, retains the strength. If you put it right in the middle, it, you lose a little bit of the strength. And plus your gutter is probably going to be off center anyway. So stick it on there, draw a line around that, um, the perimeter of the opening. Drill a little tap hole. Break out your jigsaw. And if you don't have a jigsaw, you can use a handsaw, but I would highly recommend borrowing your neighbor's jigsaw. And they're probably interested in what you're doing over here anyway. Now, if you decided to go the steel drum route, that might have been a little bit more difficult. <laughs> now, we flip this over, drop it in, hook it up. We've got a filtered rain barrel inlet. Simple as that. Keep it simple, keep it practical. Yes, question. Do Let's get the it? mic over to you. Okay, sorry. Do you have to seal it? No, you do not. Um, again, the only reason that you would need to seal it that I can think of is the mosquitoes. Um, you might want to put a screen on it, which is a perfectly viable option. Um, since there's no diverter on this system, again, it'll be flushing it out periodically. But if you wanted to get some... Uh, fiberglass screen, you cut a piece and, and make basically a pocket with the screen and, and staple it and then cock it into place and the cock would seal it so that things can't get underneath it and then you've got a screen. Um, but as far as sealing it for say evaporation or whatnot, no need, no need at all. So yes. Any questions on that part, portion of it? Yeah. It is pretty ugly, isn't it? <laughs> the question was, is there any other kind of tubing you can use? Because this is ugly stuff. Well, it just so happens that you could use this if it's a little bit better to your liking. This is handy stuff. Uh, again, instead of using the corrugated, you could hook this up. This is flex tubing. Um, that is made specifically for gutters. You could hook it up to your downspout, flex it, pull it out to the length you need, and then have it going into your, into your same kind of setup. This is one option that is perhaps more, um, more aesthetically pleasing. It's called the ground spout. You can get these just about anywhere. Um, the the ground spout, and that's just a uh, trade name. You go to go to anywhere in any hardware store and ask for flexible downspout tubing, and they'll they'll send you in the right direction. Um, you know, there's lots of different tubing options out there. Uh, once once you get it, you know, installed, it it kind of blends in. 
Um, so, but it's it's a matter of personal um, aesthetics, absolutely. Yes. Actually, you can use the regular downspout elbows if you want to as well. Yes, you absolutely could. And you maintain the same pattern. Yep, yep. Thank you very much. Yeah, you can uh, just use a regular downspout elbows, put those in there. Um, uh, and you can set it up. I mean, because you don't need it sealed, you can have it just spilling directly in, in there, and that would work just fine. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions on that portion? All right, now, basic faucet. You can't have a rain barrel without a faucet. I pre-drilled this, this hole. Um, I'm going to get this up here. This is great. I love the fact that we're answering our own questions with different ideas. And, you know, that's what this is all about. Because I am by no means an expert. I just have, you know, a, a method and I, and I know the areas that, uh, the, 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 the functions that I've used it for and have ideas. And, you know, the thing about all this stuff is that you can do it a million different ways and everybody's going to bring their own knowledge to the table. And it just it improves all of our community knowledge of the of the uh, topic. So, with a faucet, this uh, I like these. This is basically your standard hose faucet that you have outside your your house. You can pick these up at the hardware store for four bucks. I like these ball valve types because they're just on off and you you know there's not a whole lot of subtlety to controlling rainwater coming out of a rain barrel it's pretty much it's either trickling or it's trickling <laughs> um, so as far as I'm concerned the less twisting I have to do the better on my wrists so for this one the the itemized list that I was talking about before talks about using a three-quarter inch uh, faucet. And I'm going to change that on you. I think half inch is better. Three-quarter inch will work fine, but for the, for the method that I've used, half inch is a good way to go. So sorry for that confusion. It's always changing. We've always got new ideas. So what you want to do is take, take a standard paddle bit and the beauty of this is that the paddle bit, the three-quarter inch paddle bit on the half inch fitting fits perfectly so that it is just, just smaller than the thread. So hook that up to your drill. Drill your hole with it like so. Then take your hair dryer, and this is great, I love this. Turn it up to high and hold it right there for about three or four minutes. And what it does is it heats up the plastic, and then all you gotta do is take this brass and carefully, gently, and you know, with pressure, thread it on in, and it will make its own threads. Now, if you happen to have a, if you happen to have an actual threading tool, that would work too. But why use that when you can use a hairdryer? <laughs> and it really does create a nice, a nice heavy-duty seal. Um, I would still recommend using Teflon tape, as with any of these threaded things. Um, Teflon is, is if, if you've worked with any kind of plumbing or piping, you're probably familiar with it. It's real thin stuff. It's cheap.
You tear off a little piece, you thread it carefully around the threads here, leaving enough hanging over so that it will catch in the threads. And then when you thread it into place, what, the, what this polymer material does is basically fill in the gaps and give you a nice tight seal. And, and that will work just fine for quite a while. And that's what I have in this one. Again, this is an Orschelin's barrel that came with that very same thing done, although I doubt they used the hairdryer. Um, it's got threaded Teflon tape on there. I haven't had to do a thing to it. It doesn't leak at all. Now, if, you, if it does start to leak, um, or if your thread doesn't end up perfectly, which is a good possibility, then take that half inch. And again, this is another reason why I like to use the half inch instead of the three quarter. Um, and these are all hose, these are all made for garden hoses, so they've got the garden hose connection on the bottom. In the hardware store, you'll see a section. They've got all these for, for you know, your basic like plumbing type of things, and then they've got the garden hose one. So with a half inch, you can get a washer for it. It's a little bit harder for the three quarter inch. Put a washer on the outside, thread this um, through your, through your the wall of your rain barrel, get an O-ring that is half inch to three quarters inch. And actually the O-ring that's on that sheet will work fine. I put three quarter inch and that works fine. So you put that on the inside of the wall and then this is a PVC female adapter that's half inch and that screws on the back side of the wall. And then you just tighten it down and then that O-ring creates your seal in the barrel. So the washer is on the inside of the barrel? The washer is on the inside, yes. Actually, you can have it on the outside, too. It'd, it'd work either way. How do you get your hands to do You have to have long arms, <laughs> which isn't a problem for me. But, uh, you know, you can, uh, you can use a tool, and you can also have your neighbor help if you can't reach it. Again, you... You utilize your neighbors. They're there for a reason. <laughs> Trust. You don't need to use the Teflon tape. I mean, you can because it's not going to hurt, but this washer in there will do the job. And once you tighten it against the, uh, tighten it against the back, you're pretty much good to go. You don't have to worry about it. I'm not going to worry about that now. Good question. Thank you. Yes. Um, the gentleman asked if there was a certain distance off of the floor of the rain barrel that we wanted this. And it's a good idea not to put it on the very bottom because you will get some debris in there that will settle out. And this kind of works as a distilling basin that way so that you don't have to worry about this getting clogged up. So, you know, an inch or two off the ground. Plus, if you have it on the ground, then it just gives you... A Enough room to get a hose down in there. Okay, moving right along. Yes? So when you put the hair dryer, you, you heated it with the hair dryer and you put that thing in there, you didn't have the Teflon in there yet, right? Nope, I just threaded it. I was using the metal okay, threads. You, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yep. And it's good to let it, once you get it in there, it's good to let it cool, let the plastic cool with it in place so that your plastic doesn't expand back out again. Yeah. Okay, and the overflow outlet. This is another critical item for any rain barrel to have, is the overflow. Um, you don't want it spraying back out the top. For this, I recommend getting one of these, which will also work for your, for your um, larger spigot 
uh, faucet items. This is a adjustable hole saw. Um, what you can do with this is basically um, create various sizes, various size holes with it. You loosen the nut and then you can make it smaller or bigger. You, you, can, uh, you can get them that are set, f get hole saws that are set for specific sizes, but uh, this one's handy because you can use it for various things. It costs about 15 bucks, but about all those separate set size ones are about that same price a piece. You can, also rent. <laughs> can you rent one of these? Huh? Can you rent one of these? Yeah, yeah, the, the rental, yeah, the rental place is a good, you know, Arrow and um, what's the other one, Big Ten, those are great for all of these tools, and they have jigsaws and that kind of thing too. So what I like to do is I like to adjust it so that it's just slightly, slightly smaller than the, th than the outer thread. of what we're threading through here. And all these parts, all these, these first three parts um, come in a sump pump drainage kit uh, that you can get for about four bucks. Oh, where's my drill? And we have our adjustable hole saw. You're going to want to put your outflow near the back, near the top. Um, it depends on where it's going to be in your yard, but really, I mean, you, you'll have flexible tubing, so it can be just about anywhere. But generally, you want it towards the back so that you don't have to look at it. Take your knife, clean that edge up just a little bit. And then using the parts that are on your, on your list, um, the sump pump drainage kit comes with this black tubing. Again, it's not very appealing to look at, but it'll be in the back and it'll just be flowing back into your downspout or wherever your outflow is. Um, take this piece. Let's see, how was my diagram up there? You, uh, you want to take a, a, a locking back nut this is a back nut that, that is, a, is, used, in an, is a, used in electrical conduit. It's the only place I could find one that was the right size, but it's cheap, it's easy to use. The only problem is that it's steel, so it will rust. You'll have to, you'll have to replace it eventually. Um, but what you do with this is you put that on here. This gives the wall of the rain barrel something to butt up against. You put it through your barrel, put your O-ring on there, any O-ring that's, the, that's uh, rubber and has that close to one and a quarter inch inner diameter will work. And then again, you use a female adapter, PVC, to lock it onto the back. And so I'm, I'm screwing it in, and I'm pressing that O-ring up against the inside wall, like what you can see on there. And now I have a firmly attached overflow. Now all I need to do is hook up my 
my outflow pipe. I put the uh, I put the hose clamp on there, wherever that went off to, and I just run this to wherever I need to. And it's a piece of cake to slice this at whatever length you need. Uh, generally, you know, if you have a downspout set up already in place, then you can just run it right back into your downspout. You could run it to a you know a flower bed. Just run it away from your house so that it doesn't go into your sump drainage and don't run it into the street because we're trying to keep it out of the street. All right, any questions on that little portion? Yes? What happens if you don't have an outflow? If you don't have an outflow, then it all shoots out the top and makes a big mess and will run down the sides because the water's got to go somewhere. And let me tell you, in a half inch rain or a, just a sprinkle overnight, this thing will be full. Just like that, yeah, really fast. Um, Is that how they hook more than one barrel together too? Yes, and I'll get to that in just a moment. <laughs> so the outflow hole will be the same size as the gutter coming in? Good question. And a lot of these outflows are only the size of a hose. So this is quite oversized from, from what a lot of rain barrels are. And, and the thing is, is that your, your gutter is oversized um, because leaves and debris and stuff get in there. But it, it almost never, and it depends on how much roof space is going into it, but a, a downspout gutter is never full of water. It's just got water rushing through it quickly. So this is plenty, plenty big, yep. But that is a good question. All right, yes? Uh, if you're not locating your water barrel near your basement, there's no particular need for the overflow, is there? Well, you still want to have it overflowing. Um, the question was, if you don't have it near your basement, do you still need an overflow? Um, you don't want it spraying out the top because then it'll be running down the sides. It'll be, you know, causing erosion underneath your barrel. Um, it'll just be kind of a general mess, is, is my thoughts. So as long as you've got it coming out in a, you know, you can direct it away from the barrel or, or wherever it is that you might need it. But not crucial. But not crucial. Yes, and if you've got the horse trough set up, then absolutely, you could just let it flow off. <laughs> the dog will love it, and you, you know, yeah, absolutely, not crucial. Well, I, have, I have several barrels, and I just have them full, but they're not by my house. Yeah, okay, okay, excellent, yeah. All right, so, and see if we can finish up here pretty quick. Um, here's a couple outflow ideas. This one is actually... A hole buried in the ground, or a hole dug in the ground, and we filled it in with gravel. And this is at my office. And then we, and then we put a four-inch PVC pipe in there with the tube flowing into the top of it, and we backfill with dirt. And the idea with this is that we're skipping the infiltration stage of the water, or the water moving into the ground, and we're going straight to the percolation stage, where the water is moving through the ground. And this is in a rain garden. So instead of having an outflow where we've got erosion and, and sediment moving around, it's just going straight into the ground and working its way out from there. Okay, this one is, I really wanted to get to this one. This is what makes my rain barrel extremely useful and handy. It's the rapid fill spigot, I call it. And what this is, as you can see, you walk up to it, and you just turn it on, and you fill up your watering can in about five seconds, and you walk away. Now, if you can do that, if it's faster to fill your watering can out of the rain barrel than it is out of your tap, then you're going to go to the rain barrel, just because it's easy, it's quick. And that, and that to me, is, is huge, because that's what it comes down to. I mean, we're all lazy. We all want life to be easy. So, you know, you just got to... You just got to work to make life easy. <laughs> so again, these, these, these items are in that list. You basically got a threaded PVC pipe that goes through the wall. You've got a, uh, an O-ring on each side of the wall on this one. And I put an O-ring on each side because down here you've got more pressure on it. It's a bigger, it's a bigger pipe. It, you're using it a lot, so it gets a lot of torque, and um, 
so it's just good to have that extra sealed protection. This, you probably need a, a pair of uh, pliers to really torque it on there and get that O-ring sealed on there good. I like to use these to hold on to there. Again, if your arm isn't quite long enough, you can use these to really get the, get the torque you want. And then with that, um, again, you just walk up, it comes out nice and fast, close it up, it's good to go. You know, it's got two O-rings, so it's flexible, you don't have to worry about seals breaking. And the other thing is that if your O-rings get old and they start cracking, you just unscrew it and replace them. Simple as that. You can just have the rapid fill instead of the basic You absolutely can. The question is, you could just have the rapid fill and not this. That is, ab yes, absolutely your choice. However, keep in mind that soaker hoses and rain barrels make excellent companions. <laughs> And so if you, I don't even want to think about trying to adapt that to this and all that. You just put this on here, it takes, you know, another 10 minutes, another 7 bucks, and you'll have more options, basically. And, yeah. But absolutely, I mean, that one rain barrel that the fellow had in the old trash can, he doesn't have any outlet at all. He just puts his watering can in there, fills it up, and walks away. All right. Connecting the rain barrels. This is the last thing I'm going to talk about. Um, <coughs> connecting rain barrels is super easy. You've got two of them, and you want to hook them up. Hook them together. Go to the store, get some cheap hose. This costs three bucks. Um, basically, cut the ends off of it, or cut one end off of it, because you might still use the other end as a, uh, you know, just as a short segment of hose. Take your, your knife. Cheap hose cuts really easily. Surprise, surprise. Take your three-quarter inch and or you could use a half inch. Half inch would work fine. Then you could use the paddle and the paddle bit and the and the air dryer. Just make sure that you have a five eighths inch barb on it. Um, and then that just goes right in your hose like that. You can uh, put a hose clamp on there to make sure that it's doubly sealed. And the idea with this is that you again you drill the hole. You, you place this in the hole, and you can use the same threading technique that I used on the faucet, or you can get the, the female adapter and a, and a O-ring and tighten it from the back. Either one will work. This one will probably last longer. And then you connect your hoses. You know, basically, you place this in the barrel, and then you place your barrels next to each other and connect your hoses. And, and they are connected. Now the question is, you've got two rain barrels, and I want to connect them together. So I connect this one to this one, just like that. Anybody see any problems with this? This one's going to fill up. It's going to flow over to this one. This one's going to fill up, and then it's going to overflow, and it's going to overflow, and this one's never going to fill. So, you got to think about how you're going to use it because you can connect them at the top or the bottom, but they have to be level. Unless, you know, you can, you can do them on level, but it gets a little bit more complicated. Um, as long as they're level, you're not going to have to worry about that. They're, once they're both full, then your, your water is going to be diverting, and it's just going to be flowing through. Now, the question is top or the bottom? If you've connected at the bottom, it acts as one big barrel. It's just twice the storage. Then you only need one spigot, you only need one faucet, works fine. If you connect it at the top, however, 
It works like two barrels. So then, say you want to set up the soaker hose and water your garden and you want to just put it on a trickle and walk away. You'll be amazed at how fast 55 gallons will drain onto your garden. You come back, if you've got it set up like this, you've still got a full barrel of water left. If you've got it set up like this, they both just drained empty. So it depends on how you want to use it. Does that make sense? Follow me? Any questions on that, on that part? I'm going to set up two barrels in my house and I haven't decided yet. I think I'm going to do the top setup because I like the soaker hose. It's really handy um, for those dry, dry days. Um, I'm, I'm just going to ramp things up here. There's endless possibilities. Rain diverters, they work great. Again, you know, here's one from Upcycle. Um, you got to be careful because if your rain barrel isn't the same height as the diverter, you might run into some issues. There's some other types of diverters, like this one, they sell at um, Forever Green. This is a really neat one, because you install it in your downspout, you turn your rain barrel on, you turn your rain barrel off. So, um, this would be a good one for the landlord. <laughs> yes, this would be, because you can install this and that can be permanent. And the only reason I didn't think of it is because it's fairly new to me. I don't use diverters. Um, but yeah, this is a great way to, to overwinter because you've got all the pipes in place already. It's aesthetically pleasing. It's on, it's off. It in the middle, yep. You see how this is up against the corner of a building. You just cut out a piece of your downspout and put it in there. Um, when your rain barrel's hooked up, it just, the water hits this and flows into the top. And, uh, when you're, and the, the difference between this style and that is that this one, when the rain barrel fills up, it automatically keeps going down the downspout. But for this one, it always flows no matter how full the rain barrel is. So again, it's flowing out your outflow. Endless possibilities. There's, you can do a million things with it. That's the beauty of it. Make it work. This is another great way to filter. If you've, got a, if you've got a barrel like this one, just drill a couple of holes into it, fill, uh, you know, half inch holes, fill it with gravel, you've got a filter. You can clean the gravel out really easily. If you've got a brain barrel like this where it's flat on the top, again, you can go like this. You could, you could cut it larger and make a screen type of filter. There's all sorts of designs on the web. I like this one because you saw how quick and easy it was. And when you've got, when you want to check out your, your barrel, see if there's something floating, you know, see if one of your koi died, you literally pull it out, look in there, dump the leaves back out, and walk away. It's as easy as that. That's that's, that's the beauty and simplicity, simplicity. Okay. Get creative. Basically, I, just, I can just run out to my garden with this hose and, and turn, this is, it's got a Y here, and it's got a shut off on each side. And normally it's shut off. This isn't so that I can fill my rain barrel with tap water, which I could <laughs> if I wanted to impress some folks or something. You know, um, but I turn that on, turn this on, run out. I've got an automatic gravity-fed tube, you know, going anywhere I need in my yard. I don't have to switch hoses around. So there's all sorts of different things you can do with it. Get the quick connect hoses. It's amazing the possibilities. And if anybody has any other ideas, I, we're slightly out of time. Um, if anybody has any ideas, I would be happy to discuss them. We have about five minutes, so if people have any questions. And I know you have, do you have nine in your backyard? Seven? Five, ten. So there is a, a master rain Excellent. barrel person yes. here. So we got, we've got time for a couple of questions, if anyone has any questions. Or do you want to say anything about your great number of <laughs> Not particularly. Okay. 
<clears throat> I might just mention one. I might mention one thing. I turned mine upside down mm -hmm. and put a fitting into one of those top openings mm -hmm. and cut my hole, which is rigid at the bottom, bring the water in the same way you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some PV, PVC fittings. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Yeah. 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 Saves drilling the small holes. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea. So you've got it elevated so that you can yeah, same, get the same water out. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I have to have something to put that PVC is below my Mm-hmm. Yeah. And PVC, you know, this is this is kind of a simplified version, this outflow is a simplified version of my outflow on my own barrel. I did the same thing except for that I have I put an elbow in there. Um, and PVC is, you know, you can do all sorts of stuff with it, but if, you, if you're comfortable using the glue, it stinks, but it's perfectly harmless once it's, you know, set. You can put all sorts of rigid connections and whatnot and have, you know, you could, again, you could have your spigot out here, hey, you could have your barrel over here and you could be running a PVC pipe over here where you want to have the water access right next to your back door or, you know, there's all sorts of options that you can do. And the PVC works great like that because it's really easy to glue together and once it's glued, it's pretty much permanent. Any other ideas or thoughts or, oh, yeah, in the just, back here. Wait, second, done, hang on. Uh, the way my house is set up, I can envision uh, draining into one barrel from two different, two different uh, downspouts. And I was thinking, could you hook your uh, diverter line into another uh, barrel, or would that uh, at, a, at a different on a different level, but or would that lead to problems? So you've got the you have, are you are you thinking about a diverter on each downspout, or or having? Well, no, just just uh, direct feed like you had, but from two different downspouts into one barrel and then taking the uh, the overflow, I'm sorry. Ah, the overflow. The, the overflow and and running it into a lower barrel. And using a diverter on the overflow? Or just running it into Just an, running it in and oh then. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's perfectly good water. Again, it's gone through, it's gone through your screen so you shouldn't have much organic debris. Um, yeah, yeah, the, you can hook it up. The only limitation to, you know, hooking up tandem barrels is gravity. You know, and you, the, the, you just want to have, again, a, an overflow on that last barrel so that when it fills up, you know, but yeah, absolutely. So the question is, how long, how long of a soaker hose can you run on it? Well, you'd be surprised. Um, I know I was. I've got... Uh, I've got, I don't have, I have like a 50 foot soaker hose uh, that's on the, that's on the opposite end of my yard. So it's, you know, about mm, probably 50 feet away and it runs just fine. If I open this thing up, it'll be drained in two hours through that soaker hose. But it, fills the whole it does. Yeah. They, and you know, that's one thing that I looked into. You know, because they've got the ones that are flat with the holes in them, and those I think would 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 probably empty at the beginning. But it's really this this whatever this rubber material is um, really uh, disperses it nicely, and it does. It just just drips out a little bit everywhere. It I haven't been able to turn it down enough so that it's uneven. It seems to work really well. Yes. Uh, the question is, do you, do you see any problems with having a barrel on a deck? As long as you're not leaking, I think you'll be fine. Um, and, you know, because you don't want that water sitting on your, on your wood. Um, yeah, but uh, I, you know, I've, I've never, you know, I've, I've encountered leaks and I've, and I've fixed them all. But never do you have, it's never perspiring, you know, it's, you're never getting condensation happening. So that bottom stays dry. And I've got mine up on cinder block. And so you, 
I can see as, as soon as there's any kind of leakage happening, the cinder block's, you know, getting wet, and I haven't had any kind of problems with that, so. I didn't pay any attention to it, and it exploded over the winter. So you do really have to, you know, not leave it full of water because it gets cold in the winter and it burst. So it's going to go to the landfill and have a new home. But um, thank you very much, Chant. That was mm -hmm. a great presentation. You'll be able to watch this again on Channel 10. We will add this uh, DVD to our collection so you can borrow it, and we'll post the information that he's given us on the Eco Iowa City website. So if you picked up that green bookmark, you'll see the address or go to the library's website and you can find it really easily. But thank you very much. This was a wonderful presentation. Absolutely. Thank you.